Hey y'all, my name is Samah Ali and I'm one of the Associate Shorts Programmers for Doc NYC. I am very pleased to lead the Q&A for Doc NYC's Columbia Shorts Program for this year's festival. We have many directors joining us virtually today. I'll allow everybody to introduce themselves as well as which film that they directed. Let's start with Sarah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Jenks, and I am the co-director of the Vet Van. The Vet Van partner, why don't you introduce yourself next? Hi, I'm Lizzie Mulvey, and I'm also the co-director of the Vet Van. Lovely to have you two here. I'm Curtin Up, the team of Curtin Up, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, I'll go first. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I'm co-director of Curtain Up with Hui. Hi, my name is Hui Tong. I'm also the co-director of uh, Curtain Up. And last but certainly not least, the team of Holding Fire. Hannah, why don't you start us off? Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm the co-director for Holding Fire. And I'm Eleanor Waza, Hannah's uh, co-director for Holding Fire Stuff. And I'm sorry for the ringing. Say la vie. In a pandemic, everybody's trying to reach us. So don't worry, but I'm very happy to have everybody here present with us today. One of the greatest things about having a virtual festival is that we're having folks tune in from all over um, the world to their screenings, be able to have our questions and answers and all that stuff. So thank you all for tuning in at home and directors. I want to get right to it. And I will actually start with the team of Holding Fire. Y'all can decide who wants to speak, hold the mic first, but this is a question for everybody. What inspired your film? Um, yeah, so I can take part of it and Eleanor, if you want to add anything as well. Uh, what inspired Holding Fire? I think um, we made it at a time when it was kind of long before the election season was happening now but it was during the midterm elections in 2018. And um, we were pretty inspired by Muslim women in America, Arab women who were kind of coming out and mobilizing their communities to vote. Um, communities that previously weren't really participating as much in elections. And yeah, we were kind of inspired by that and the women who were leading these movements. So, yeah, and then we met Samaya in Brooklyn as she was in the midst of campaigning in one of these elections, which was the midterm elections in 2018. Anything to add, Eleanor? Um, well, I think, you know, I joined Hannah a bit further down the line. And so I don't think I can answer to you what inspired the movie, but what inspired me to join the movie was uh, Samaya's character, uh, her strength and it really resonated with me uh the these women fighting against islamophobia especially uh with you know my own background in france and how islamophobia is also existing there obviously so i think it really resonated with me to see those women fighting on the ground in the u.s even though it's not my country I hear that. I actually, I think what you have mentioned about characters is, you know, really important. And I actually want to ask the team of Curtain Up, not only the same question, what inspired your film, but then also how did you meet your young characters who were taking the stage and being in Frozen? Koi, do you want to perhaps talk about it? Unmute. <laughs> Sorry. So it was uh, summer 2018, and it was time of you know crazy rich Asians just came out, and there's all this discussion about you know Asian representation in the entertainment industry, and there's a lot of disputes about you know being Asians, whether crazy rich Asians was you know an authentic representation of the Asian communities in the U.S. Um, I was myself a theater enthusiast, a musical enthusiast, so you know it's kind of natural for me to think about how how do people, how do Asian people or Asian artists doing uh, in the theater industry. So basically, I was like, you know, doing a lot of reporting and research on this community in New York City. And that led me to, um, you know, find out this program um, called uh, the National Asian Artists Project, which, um, you know, they had a, a they cooperated with the with a local elementary school in Chinatown. And there's this group of kids doing, you know, uh, Disney musicals. So I was thinking, you know, there's this kind of natural tension there, you know, and kind of like all Asian or all Asian American 
kind of like his cast uh, doing like, you know, Disney musicals like um, Frozen, right? So um, I just went to the school. I was very drawn by the kids the first time I visited them because they were like, they were much more professional uh, than I thought. You know, the teachers really thought, you know, uh, try to train them to be like future actors and actresses. So yeah, I started filming right away. And um, that's how, how it started. the story got started. I guess in terms of characters, so I joined Hui also later on in the project, I guess a few months after he started filming. Um, and I think we took a while to sort of like zero in on the characters that we wanted to focus on. And I guess it was just over time, like hanging out with them and um, looking at which kids sort of like warmed up a bit more to us uh, compared to the rest. And it helped also, I guess, both, uh, that both William and Charlotte um, had uh, main character, uh, as in had lead roles in, in the play that they were playing. Um, so, yeah. Now they say some of the hardest things to work with in this business is, you know, pets, babies, and kids. So how did you folks go around that? Because all of your main characters um, were under the age of 18. <laughs> Oh, it's, you know, we, we, we do have to sign release forms with them, you know, for, the, for, while we started filming. But I guess, you know, for the kids, they were naturally quite, you know, they, they didn't really understand what a documentary is. So the first, like, month into the filming, I, they, they thought I was from, like, TV station. I was, like, part of the TV crew because um, a lot of TV station people actually came to the school to film. There, there were a, a very famous, like, award-winning theater club. But, you know, it's, it's all about time. Like, you know, I think, like, two to three months into the filming, we also went to Atlanta with the parents and, you know, kind of talk to their parents, talk to their family members, and really let them know what a project we're doing, like documentaries. Like, we also told the kids, like, it's like in between, like, you're also the star of our film. You're kind of like, you're kind of like in a movie, but you want to be authentic, just as yourselves. So, um, yeah, it took some time for us, for them also to understand what we were doing. And um, yeah, I guess things went quite well after like the first few months. That's so cool, thank you. Um, the team of the vet band, you know, what inspired you, first of all, capturing this very unique story? And then also, how did you meet your two families? Because that, I was like, how, how did this happen? Where was the connection? Lizzie, Sarah, who wants to start us off? Um, I'll start us off. So <clears throat> we, kind of stumbled into this story. So I was living um, in East Harlem, which is where the van parks on Saturdays and Fridays. And I was walking by one day and basically there was just like 50 people on the street corner with these animals and like started to asking people what they were doing here. And over time, we kind of kept coming back and spending more time there. and realized that there was a lot happening and that there was a bigger story here. There were all these rich characters, there was drama, there was um, intensity and fast paced motion and a really challenging filming environment. Um, so that we kind of we kind of fell into it and then the, the story sort of revealed itself. And um, in terms of finding our two families, we went through a pretty extensive casting process. We spent like I don't know how many days at the van to find those two people um, and in that process we would interview and shoot sequences with multiple people and um, it was pretty intense because we we're asking for a lot of access to characters very quickly because we would meet them that day and we would hang out with them while they're waiting for their appointment and then when they would go in the van we'd ask to go with them and so it was kind of an atypical process in terms of finding characters and casting. Lizzie, feel free to add if I missed anything. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why we chose the two women in our film was because of their intensity of the relationship that they had with their animals. I think that we really felt that, you know, we needed to show that people rely on animals, not just because they like them around, because they're cute, but also because they help help with their emotional um, stability um, and also physical health. They also help that too. So I think we wanted to show a deeper relationship there um, that these women had. There was something one of your characters said at the very top of the film about how vet bills are more expensive than 
human bills. And I definitely immediately was locked into the story because um, I have a senior cat and his vet bills uh, make me go on to uh, a care club, which I have to pay monthly fees for. And so I immediately was like, they know exactly <laughs> the same issues that I'm dealing with. I wish I knew this vet man before signing on with my current veterinarian. Um, brilliant story, honestly. And what a unique way of finding, you know, just naturally finding it. And I think it actually brings me to my next question. Um, what was the production process like for all of you? Um, vet Band, why don't we start with you folks since you already have the mic? So um, we started shooting this film in, so I started it at the, in the fall of 2018 and then Lizzie came on a couple of months later and we spent just a lot of time shooting. We have so much footage and so many characters that we followed and some that didn't make it into the film. And we spent like 16 hour days at this vet van over the summer. We were there at like 8.30 in the morning and sometimes not getting home until 11 o'clock at night, um, waiting for drama to unfold. And so, and we filmed, you know, some other characters where their stories diverged so much from the van that they are like now a standalone piece. Um, but we spent a lot of time filming and then we spent, you know, a year in our program editing it, but Lizzie and I actually spent the last year continuing to edit our film. Um, because it is an ensemble cast in a short film, it took us a very, very long time to figure out our story and to how to piece it together. Um, and so we spent a, just a really long time on the edit. Um, so. And also because it's an ensemble cast, the editing I think also took a long time because we had to figure out how to weave in each of the stories um, and in a way that kept people interested. Um, so I think that, yeah, it was for a short film, doing an ensemble cast, I think was um, a, a good challenge, an interesting challenge. Wow. <laughs> I'm really curious about, you know, this program, because it sounds like all of y'all um, kind of linked up with your co-director around um, three or four months after you started. Is that like a particular system with the Columbia's um, filmmaking program? Anyone answer my question? <laughs> yeah, I'll just start since I have my mic on. Um, so basically everybody in the beginning of the program starts their own story and starts reporting on it. And then about you know a couple months into the program, basically everybody goes through a pitch process of pitching their story. And um, there's a panel of people who review those pitches, review a proof of concept, and they decide which ones to green light. And then the teams either try to go back and green light the other one by making changes, or they decide to just jump on the bandwagon for one of those stories and to move forward. And the idea is that the second story becomes a backup in case something falls through, um, which does happen very often. And because the program is on this very specific expedited time frame, it's only a 12 month program for the documentary students to learn how to shoot and edit and find a story and shoot it and then edit it. So um, it's just, we have to move very quickly and that's why they kind of have everybody work in a pair where you're kind of moving forward on two stories in case something happens. Interesting, wow. Well, now that we have this context in mind, I wanna give the team of Holding Fire the mic. Um, and ask them about their production process. What was that like? Because now we are fully oriented, 12 months to get this story up and ready and edited and everything. Yeah, I can start with that. And then Eleanor, feel free to jump in. Um, so the production, are you asking us about the production process again? Or is this about? Yes, the production uh, process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we just kind of, well, I initially started filming with Samaya because I was kind of hanging around in this area where she's pretty active in Bay Ridge, speaking to a lot of different, you know, shop owners, but also women and organizations in the area to hear about what were some of the main issues. But we were studying in Columbia, which is geographically very far from Bay Ridge. So it was a lot of like, kind of just getting on the train for like an hour and a half or something, meeting with Samaya, following her, whatever she was doing, 
and as an activist like the work never stops and it's usually at a moment's notice so we would constantly be like texting back and forth just like where are you where are you now where are you going next and she'd be like oh we're protesting outside of fox news come and meet us and then it'd be like eleanor we have to go and then we'd have to like get all of our kit like in a second's notice and run down to meet her but and a lot of these times that we filmed they didn't make it in the film um we filmed a lot of different events a lot of different places met a lot of different people that she's working with closely and really kind of through all these different moments um, really got to know the community and became very close with many people in the community and spent a lot of time with her, like just in her car, driving around to different places and talking to her about her family, her kids, worries and things that were very close and personal to her and not just about the activism and the wider external things, but a lot of like intimate things. And through these conversations, we were able to like, we have a story I think that could blend the personal and the public persona in a way. Yeah. Eleanor, if you want to add. Yeah, and to go back to the this idea of production, we so Hannah started shooting in November of 2018. And I without laying, I think we can admit that we still shot a bit in the fall of 2019. Went to pick up some less things, even though we edited most of the film and we continued editing it. Um, at the same time, and I think that's also a, part, a particularity of this program is that there's a moment where obviously you're gonna have to shoot and edit at the same time, which gets very confusing, especially when you're doing it for the first time and figuring out how you tie everything together in the edit when you're still shooting was probably one of the things that we learned even though it was a challenge. Thank you for the Curtain Up team. Um, I think we're, we have a really good sense of the production process and how tight it was for y'all. But I actually want to ask you a different question. What was the greatest lesson you learned from the kids when you were documenting them over the course of, you know, 12, eight to 12 months? Okay. For me, um, I think never underestimate kids. I mean, I, I think I was pretty, um, Surprise, I don't know if that's the right word, that, you know, a lot of the issues that we discussed in our film, um, uh, representation, cultural identity, I mean, these are not like new issues, especially in New York. Um, they are often, you know, like screamed and shouted about, uh, but mostly by adults, advocates, but it's also very much in these kids, um, in their as in their mind, like there, there were many times where we didn't really have to like prompt them, but they knew what uh, we were trying to get at during like some of the sit down interviews and could speak very personally as well to it. Um, and I guess uh, the other point uh, would be, I guess me speaking from my experience as a print journalist, which um, is what I am for the most part of my uh, journalism life. Um, I think most times we don't really like interview kids or quote kids in like um, newspaper articles. But like, I guess I, I realized that I've come to appreciate that they are actually very honest in some of their opinions and like very no, um, like unfiltered opinions, which can sometimes be closer to the truth than, you know, like what someone would come up with in a press release. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I was about to say like, similarly, I also felt very impressed by how kind of like how the kids had such a deep thoughts on their identity and all on, you know, what, what the world they were living in at this young age, you know, sometimes when I was asking a question, I haven't even, like, especially with William, like, haven't even finished the question. Like, I saw the lies in his eyes, like, I, I knew that he got me, he got, like, what I, I was trying to ask, you know, and he gave us, like, very, you know, surprisingly impressive, you know, uh, answers. Uh, but also, like, I think, um, also related to the production process, I think a big lesson we learn is that sometimes we don't really, we, we can't really like take for granted uh, our, our like connection with the kids. Cause you know, sometimes they're not very naturally open to us. You know, the first few months into the filming, they, they thought we were just uh, filming the rehearsals, right? So they were like, you know, they're naturally uh, opening up themselves, you know, uh, because they were, they were performing on the stage, right? So they, uh, they weren't that, you know, re resistant to our cameras either. 
but that wasn't actually real connection, like authentic connection with them. Because um, I guess four months into the filming, there was a, such a crisis happening that they suddenly started thinking that we were stalkers because we were getting too close to them. And, um, you know, a lot of kids were getting kind of like very resistant and it's very obvious in front of the camera. They were trying to avoid from our cameras. So that, that was like when we really need to say, okay, now we need to build some connection with them. So we actually, so there was some misunderstanding. They thought we, we knew too much of their secrets, right? Because they're kids. So we actually went to apologize to their family members and their parents. Some of the parents actually told the kids that, you know, there's some misunderstanding. And the next week, some of the kids even came up to us and apologized to us, like with some tears in their eyes. Um, so actually after this crisis was when we thought we, we did like have really strong connection with the kids. So as you can see, we have like all the home scenes, you know, entering their families. Those things actually take, uh, took place all after the, such a crisis, you know, when we really build a connection with the kids. So I guess, you know, you really have to treat the kids as adults in a way that, you know, it, it takes time to, to, to really be their friends, right? We're, we're now just TV station crew, so. That is the sweetest story. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked that. That is adorable. Okay, well, <laughs> on that note, I think my final question for everybody is what, is, what are you currently working on? Um, Bet Band team, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, I actually just finished work on a PBS frontline film, Whose Vote Counts, um, about voter suppression. Um, and it is available for streaming on YouTube and uh, PBS. So just been, just wrap that up. Um, yeah. Um, I will add, Lizzie and I also have another offshoot of our vet van film about a uh, homeless man who was living in the Bronx with his dog, who that's going to be like the next piece that we're going to, we got to finish up editing. Um, so we have that to go as well. Um, and then personally, I'm working on a, documentary series about World War II veterans. It's gonna be in a video game called Medal of Honor that they're revamping for the Oculus series. And um, an offshoot of that is a short film, Colette, that is currently in the festival circuit that I was the associate producer and assistant editor on. I have seen Colette. Oh, wow. you have? Wow, mm -hmm. nice. Working as a programmer means that I've seen hundreds of thousands of films for the every year. So I definitely <laughs> see Colette. Congratulations on that. I have seen it on the festival cycle. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Kelly, why don't you let us know what you're working on next? Sure. Um, maybe I'll start with like our update for Curtain Up. So it started out as a short and uh, we, Hui and I actually expanded it into a feature slightly over, over the hour. And that feature length film is uh, in the festival circuit right now. And we are also um, in the process of discussing a broadcast deal um, with America Reframe. Um, and okay, I guess like on, the per on a personal note, I'm back in Singapore. Um, I'm working at a newspaper in Singapore. Uh, and on the side, I'm also working on um, my next film, actually filming uh, a friend of a friend who has early onset dementia. Um, yeah. Wow, that's gonna be a tough film. Especially yeah. a personal journey, quite a personal journey. Mm -hmm. uh, Hui. Right, also, stuff. yeah, just as Kylie mentioned, I think the, uh, the past few months is really, we spent a lot of time, you know, doing the, all the festival preparations and distribution and, you know, all the stuff like that. And we're also planning on some community engagement, um, you know, screenings later on. So that would be one thing to come up, uh, I, guess, I guess, in the near future. And um, personally, um, I, you know, during the quarantine, I have to kind of stay at home. So I actually, I just finished a book um, kind of uh, on the issue of identity. It's also kind of like an expansion from the documentary, but you know, the documentary is about Chinese American kids, but the book also talked about Asian Americans, mainland Chinese and overseas Chinese students. So it's all this issue of identity, how it was formed historically and how it was like, how it's bringing us like all of issues. And you know, it's like, it's a like history and cultural analysis book. Um, I'm flying back to China today, like this evening uh, from LA. So that's why I'm in LA because my flight is from LA. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm excited to embark a new journey. I have some new ideas to shoot in China um, because uh, the pandemic in China is like much better. So I can go around pretty much free. Um, so yeah, I'll be there um, in the, for the next few months uh, at least. 
Wow, I can't see what I can't wait to see what's going to come out for both of y'all. That's so cool. And last but not least, holding fire. What what are y'all working on? Hannah, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so at the moment, in the career level, I'm working as an associate producer at Left Right Productions, researching some ideas for an upcoming documentary series. Um, and then personally, I mean, Eleanor and I are continuing to try to get Holding Fire out there and raise more awareness on the subject, especially during this very, very, very close election date, <laughs> um, and trying to kind of build it up around that time. Um, I started during the pandemic, you know, I kind of got shut down at home, but I started working with Black Youth Project 100 on a short documentary kind of documenting um, acts of community surrounding the uprisings after George Floyd the protests and everything. So that should be coming out today. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so those are the main things. And you know, once the lockdown ends and there's an opportunity to travel, there's some ideas that I'd love to start filming in New York or also in Palestine. And so we'll see, yeah. And I was working as a producer for the BBC in New York and then in Paris, um, you know, coronavirus um, immigration situation. So now I'm in Paris and I'm looking for, yeah, it's same as Hue. It's going to be a new journey. I was in New York, now I'm in Paris. So figuring it out. Um, the thing is, we're probably going to be in lockdown again. So I don't know, but hoping for the best and being able to shoot outside soon as well which is not going to be happening anytime soon, unfortunately, here. Oh, second wave is lockdowns. <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, we're all here and we're all holding space with each other. So I want to thank all of the directors in the room for being a part of this Q&A. And I want to thank everybody at home for selecting this program. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed these films. And I also hope that you have a lovely virtual festival and check out more films from our 2020 lineup. Directors, thank you again for being here. It's been awesome. Thank you.